fall apart You're the one that guides my heart Lord, I need you, oh, I In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Lenten journey continues toward the cross. It's a journey marked with suffering. But suffering produces endurance. Endurance produces character. Character produces hope. And hope in Christ does not put us to shame. Our hope in Jesus is strong and living. Yet, we have often taken for granted the profound reality of Christ's death for us. We have ignored how weak and ungodly we have been. Still, our Heavenly Father grants us access to his throne of grace. And so we ask for his forgiveness. Heavenly Father, I have lacked integrity and acted shamefully, and I have even despaired of life itself. Have mercy upon me and reconcile me back to you, so that I may rejoice once more on account of Jesus. Amen. At just the right time, while we were still weak and ungodly, Jesus died for us and reconciled us to God as a called and ordained servant of Jesus and by his authority. I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 
I am forgiven and at peace with God. And so, my dear brothers and sisters, the Lord be with you. Together, let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, in your perfect timing, you died for us who are weak and ungodly. Be present with us as we endure the sufferings of this world so that we may learn how suffering leads to endurance, character, and a hope that never puts us to shame. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. And if all the kids can come up forward, see a bunch of young people. I brought a couple of things with me. Here comes Carly and Lauren, his bow. Here comes Owen and Molly, and here comes Nana. Here comes Adriana. I know you're one of your M&Ms, I know. Oh, boy, you're so good, Adriana. Man, oh, man. Oh, you put the money in there, Owen? You found it, honey? Yeah. yeah. You gonna sit with me or Adriana? You sit with me. Me? Alright, well come on up. You cried? Yeah. Had a tough time in Sunday school, did we? You're gonna be sent to the pastor's office. Well, I brought something with me today. Actually, I brought two things with me today. But first, can you say something? Can you say, be prepared? Be prepared. Hey, nice and loud. Be prepared. Be prepared. Say, be prepared. Be prepared. Say it again, loud. Be prepared. Be prepared. All right. Hey, you know what I did this morning? Really bright and early this morning. I went on my phone, like I normally do, and I checked out the weather, all right? I checked out the weather. That's you. I checked out the weather, and look what it says for Tuesday. It says 68 degrees. Can you say, woo hoo there you go. Hey, Adriana, since you're here, we're going to make you my assistant. There we go. Adriana, next to the 68, what's the weather going to be like? What? What's the weather going to be like? What? Wednesday, Tuesday, it's like Tuesday. It's going to be warm. But what's the little diagram between the word Tuesday and the 68? Oh, Stormy. Stormy. Rain? Yeah. Lightning? Clouds? Yeah. Yeah. All day? Yeah. Well, you know what? I better be prepared. I better put one of these in the car, my office. You know what this is? Umbrella. All right, it's an umbrella. Hold on to that, Adriana. Thank you. I also better bring something else with me. You know what I got to bring with me? I don't know where it went to. Here it is here. Just in case the lights go out, I got my flashlight. I keep it above the sink in the house, in the kitchen, all the time. Got to be prepared. All right? So, Adriana, the weather's going to be what? On what, Tuesday? Raining and storming. I got my umbrella. I got my flashlight. I am ready. I am prepared. What's wrong? What's wrong? Why am I not prepared? My feet. Why am I not prepared? My feet. Bo, one more time. My feet. Because it's not open. Oh. My flashlight. My no batteries. But hey, I got a flashlight and I got an umbrella. I'm prepared, right? Yeah. No. I have to. Open up the umbrella. I'm glad you came up, Adriana. 
And what does my flashlight need? Batteries. I gotta open this up. Hold that, little boy. How do they go in? We just plug. Okay, we'll try this way. Here we go. Let's see if this works. Yeah. Yeah. You have faith in me, Owen, don't you? It works, Adriana. Hold on to that. Now, is Adriana ready for bad weather? Yeah. Is she prepared? So, sort of, yeah. Is she prepared? Yeah. Say yes. Is she prepared? Yeah. Is she prepared? Yes. Is she prepared? Yeah. Yes. Is she prepared? Yes. Is she prepared? Is she prepared? Yes. She's now ready for to be prepared. It does no good if Adriana's umbrella is not opened up. It does no good if there's no batteries in her flashlight. Okay? It does no good. Adriana can say, I got an umbrella. But if she's not prepared, she's not prepared. Doesn't make sense, right? But the same thing in life. How are we prepared for what comes our way? Ah, the Word of God and prayer. We need to open up the Word of God, just like we opened up the umbrella. We need to let prayer shine through our lives, just like the light does. It doesn't do us any good if we have a Bible in a closet and if we pray once in a while and say, well, I prayed once this month. It's not good to say, I got a Bible someplace in my house. To be prepared for what comes our way, we need to open up and let God's light shine and protect us with God's word and God's prayer. That's what it means to be prepared. It does Adriana no good if this is like this. She's going to get all wet. Okay? She needs to open up her umbrella so she can be singing in the rain. Get it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, she's prepared. But you know what? We need to pray about that. So if you guys do me a favor, can you pray with me that God helps us to be prepared? Okay? okay. Ready? Hands up. Ready? One, two, three. God, thank you for today where we can talk about being prepared. And so many times we're not prepared. And sometimes we think we are. We have the umbrella in the closet and a Bible someplace like an umbrella and your word and, and prayer someplace in the house, but we just don't open up your word. And sometimes we don't pray, and sometimes we pray as a last thing instead of the first thing, which makes us not prepared. So help us to be prepared, just like we are for bad weather. Help us to be prepared for life by reading your word and by praying. Now we know that just because we pray, it's not always going to be perfect. We know that, Lord. But still, we want us, you want us to be prepared. So help us to open your word and help us to pray. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Amen. Adriana, you're such a good sport. After worship, you can go to my office and take as many M&Ms as you want. I us put this back. Hey, guys, thanks for coming up. Okay, Molly, can you do me a favor? And Nana can help you. During the offering, can you take that plate and walk around and maybe people put a change in there? And then if you can bring it back up with the usher during the offering? Thank you. Hi, little buddy. Good job, little buddy. Speaking of being prepared, by prayer, the gospel lesson. Talks about that. And that's our theme for today. How to be prepared and not be complacent. And now, the word of God. Our Old Testament reading is from Genesis, the 17th chapter. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless, that I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. Then Abram fell on his face and God said to him, Behold, my covenant is with you and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. 
No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you into nations, and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant, to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And God said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall become nations. Kings of peoples shall come from her. This is the word of the Lord. Our epistle reading is from Romans, the fifth chapter. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. More than that, we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since, therefore, we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we now have received reconciliation. This is the word of the Lord. If you are so able, please rise for the hearing of the Holy Gospel. And once again, the Holy Gospel will serve as the basis for this sermon this morning. And it comes from St. Matthew chapter 26, verses 36 through 46. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And after going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, So could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again for the second time he went and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. And again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. So, leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words again. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, Sleep and take your rest later on. See, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, My betrayer is at hand. This is the gospel of the Lord. Please have your seat.
Demands my all. Well, if it demands my all, then that must mean that we're all prepared, right? That means that we're not complacent, right? Hmm. As I share with my kids up front, my kids, the kids, your kids. God calls us to be prepared. And as I shared again with the, with the kids, one of the ways is not only to read his word, but to be in prayer. And God is talking, Jesus is talking to the disciples, especially the three with him, to be prepared, to, to be on guard. Now, I think as a nation, we've done a pretty good job. Because that's what history has taught us. And I think as a nation that we have learned our lesson well, especially since the days of 9-11. Because I do think that as a nation we are determined that 9-11 will not happen again. Because, and here's the thing, we cannot be complacent. We need to be prepared. Now, that's on the national level. But you know what? It also has an impact on our spiritual life as well. Because we cannot become complacent in spiritual matters either. We can't push things of eternal value to the fringes of life. Because if we do, Satan will find us, like he did those disciples, asleep. And if we're asleep, then we are robbed of all the purpose and of life and, and promise that has come to us. And failure to see the danger and to be prepared leads to spiritual ruin. Now, let me just use Adriana for a second. We just talked about being prepared. Now, Adriana knows full well that come Tuesday, Although it's going to be 68 degrees, it's not going to be a good day weather-wise. It's going to be stormy, raining, thunder, lightning. And if she decides to wake up on Tuesday morning or go out the front door with no coat on, no boots, no rain hat, I think you still wear rain hats or not, umbrella, and gets out in the rain and says, oh, why? Yeah, it's pretty wet out here. She's not prepared. And that's why Jesus is talking to his disciples. And he says, stay awake. You need to be prepared. And he takes them to a place called Gethsemane. Beautiful garden. And it's a place where Jesus went before. And he gathered with his disciples to find rest and, and, and strength and communion with his heavenly Father. They knew the place, and Jesus knew the place. He was there before. But this night was different. You see, this night... 
there's no rest. Jesus is wrestling with God, and he's wrestling with God in prayer. And even while he wrestles with God in prayer, he's also wrestling with the tempter. Because in his human nature, he's seeking the presence and the comfort of his disciples, and so he brings them with him. He wants them to be present, not just for himself, but to prepare them for what they too must face. And that's why he says to them, watch and pray, be prepared that you may not enter into temptation. He wants them to find strength for what lies just around the corner. And so he says, be prepared. Now is not the time for complacency. Again, back to our spiritual side, there is no time for spiritual complacency either. We're living in 2024. It is not time for spiritual complacency. And so we hear his, 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 his words, and we hear Jesus dealing and talking with his disciples, his sleeping disciples. And he deals with us too. And he says to us, be prepared. Watch and pray, be prepared. He says, then Jesus went out with the disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. And he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful even to death. Remain here and watch with me. Be prepared. And going on a little further, he fell on his face and he prayed, saying, My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but as you will. Then he came back, and he came his, to his disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, So could you not watch with me one hour? Two more times, Jesus comes and he finds the same thing. Complacent disciples. Sleeping disciples. But I hope you caught the inflection in my voice. Because notice that Jesus specifically addressed Peter twice in that text. And he brought Peter and the two sons of Zebedee. And he said to Peter, so could you, singular in the Greek, so could you not watch with me one hour? He calls him out. Why? Remember just last week? Peter was the one that boasted. I will not fall away. Well, he above everyone else should be the one staying awake. But nope. He's sound asleep. Again, last week we saw Peter boasting. But his boasting was not based on faith, but on pride and confidence. Well, overconfidence. Well, if he was going to keep himself from falling like he said he was going to, he certainly would have been watchful, alert, prepared, ready for anything and everything. He wasn't. Complacency hit Peter and the others big time. But today, something is different. See, today, Peter adds to his overconfidence and lack of wisdom. He's oblivious totally oblivious to the threats that might be out there. There's no real danger. No real danger be coming at this time of the night. That's what he thinks. And temptation? What temptation? Has he even crossed his mind? Yet by his conduct... In the next few hours, we all know that Peter would demonstrate the folly of overconfidence, pride, 
and complacency. He's not prepared. Peter and all those sleeping disciples reflect us, our state and our conduct on many occasions. Yes, we have our Bible, and yes, we pray once in a while, but the same thing is true for us. We sometimes get complacent when it comes to our spiritual state. Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. Watch and pray. Be prepared. Do not become complacent. Well, then Jesus expands. He, he expands and he, he elaborates on his warning, right? Perhaps he might say, I want you to be on guard against all the works of the flesh, like greed, envy, and lust, and hatred, and the rest. So watch and pray. Be prepared. Don't be complacent. And sometimes we say, hmm. And so often we don't follow what Jesus says. We doze off. And, and, and we let these things, these sins, move into our lives and, and make their home inside of us. And Jesus says, don't let anyone or anything distract you from my word, where I teach you how to live and how to have abundant life and how to live forever. Watch and pray. Be prepared. Don't be complacent. And often we say, hmm, and we doze off. And so often we neglect reading the Bible and neglect worship and Holy Communion. And we say, well, we'll get back sometime. Jesus says, keep your priorities straight. It's okay to work hard. It's okay to, to get ahead and to be successful and to make money, but let those things be your servant, not your master. Watch and pray. Be prepared. Don't be complacent. And again, sometimes we say, mm, and we doze off, and we get comfortable and all these earthly things, and, and we put them at the top of the list. And all those spiritual things that should be number one begin to fall farther and farther off the list until maybe they don't even appear on the list. And, and, and this failure to watch and pray, this, this failure to be prepared, this, this failure of complacency, it doesn't happen overnight. It happens gradually. You miss one Sunday worship, it's easy to miss two, and it's easier to miss three, it's easier to miss four. You don't go a day without you go a day without reading your Bible. Next day it's easy not to read your Bible. Third day, it's even easier not to read your Bible. It happens gradually. Putting God first is not always easy. I know that. And Jesus knows that. That's why he told those disciples to watch and pray. But so often we leave God out of our thinking. We leave God out of our planning. We, live, we leave God out of our living. We, we ignore his divine and loving will in our lives and we become complacent. And when push comes to shove, we're not prepared. When the storms of life come our way, we're not holding an open umbrella. We sit and we kick the dirt and say, gee, maybe I should have got the umbrella out of the attic or out of the closet. When the storms of life knock out the light in our lives, why is it only then that we search for the flashlight and then sometimes realize that batteries are dead or not even in the flashlight? The same is true in our spiritual life. Sometimes we become too complacent because we're not prepared. We're back to the garden. You also heard that, that Jesus is talking about agony. He's talking about suffering. He's talking about wrestling with God in prayer. 
Well, what's all that mean? What does it mean? Does it mean that Jesus, Jesus was afraid of suffering? Does it mean that, that Jesus was afraid of death? No. Because here is the ultimate temptation to overcome in his life. The temptation to avoid the cross. Father, if it be thy will, let this cup of suffering pass from me. Temptation to overcome the cross. In his human nature, that's what Jesus prayed. But I love that biblical word, nevertheless. Love that word, nevertheless. Not my will, but your will be done. See, his prayer was answered. His prayer was answered. God's will is done. And Jesus goes forth to meet his betrayer. And the redemptive work is reaching its climax dead ahead in the cross. So now for Jesus, it's onward, it's forward to the cross. That suffering in Gethsemane, that suffering in that garden, is climaxing in the cross. And in that cross, it's deeply personal for us. So how important is it for us to be awake? How important is it for us to be prepared? How important is it for us not to be complacent? So we realize the great transfer that happened at that cross. Yeah, the transfer. That the sin of every man, woman, and child of all time, the sins of the past, the present, and the future is taken away from us and nailed to a cross. All that sin is put on Jesus, not on us. Isaiah said, the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. You hear that? The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He became sin for us, Paul says. With the sin goes the guilt, the punishment, the hell for every human being who has ever lived, who is living, and who ever will live is all on Jesus, not on us. But here's the thing. That's not how we think. That's how God thinks. This is how God acts. And he says it counts for us. Our sins are on Jesus. Our death is on Jesus. Our hell is on Jesus. This is God dealing justly with our sin, so that in Jesus, he will deal mercifully and graciously with us, that we will go to heaven and not the other way around. And this is good news. This is good news. And I'm asking you to let this good news beat inside your hearts. If you don't believe me, listen to John. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Hear it from Peter. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Hear it from Jesus himself. Take heart. Your sins are forgiven. There's only one word to, to describe all of that. And you know the word as well as I do. Love. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever believeth shall not perish but have everlasting life. We all know that. That's John 3.16. But here's the thing. So many of us recite John 3.16 that we've learned no more yea high. And we stop there. We put the period in the paragraph. And I want to encourage you to do something. To memorize verse 17. Because 17 is just as powerful as verse 16. 17 says this. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. 
powerful stuff, right? And this is the gospel. This is the good news. And this good news should wake you up to be prepared, not to be complacent. And it should move you to pray, just like I encourage the kids. It moves you to pray so that you can, with confidence, draw near to the cross, to draw near to the throne of grace, that there you receive the mercy and the love and the grace of God at the foot of his cross. And this isn't law, it's gospel. It's the gospel of God. The gospel of God that says, I don't want you to be complacent in your spiritual lives. I don't want you to be unprepared. The road ahead is not a good road, folks. Be prepared. And don't be complacent. That's the message he tried to get across to Peter and his disciples. And now he's making that to us. He says to us today to be prepared. He says to us today, don't be complacent about your faith. But stay awake. Be alert. Because the days ahead are not going to be good. This is Peter's story. And this is our story. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, we do pray. Amen. And so now with the peace of God that goes far above a human understanding, may keep all our hearts and all our minds in the love of Jesus Christ, our Lord and the Savior, that we do not become complacent and that we are always prepared. In him we pray and praise. Amen. And so now let us receive the gifts of God. And Molly, if you could help out with the kids offer. As we come to God in prayer this morning, I want to just add a couple of names to our prayer list that you see in the bulletin. Uh, this morning, Scott asked us to keep uh, his, one of his co-workers in prayer. Uh, Tracy is going through a very difficult time. Um, and also, Samantha uh, Van Weston uh, asked if we can keep her in prayer as she has some things in her life that she needs to to have God's answer on. And then Liz also uh, shared with us that uh, Jessica uh, will be having a second knee surgery on this coming Wednesday. And then uh, Adana last night shared with me that uh, one of the pastor's wives uh, that she, I guess, communicates with on social media uh, last night went through a double lung transplant. Um, so Tanya is her name, and uh, 
I know although you don't know her personally, God does. And we bring all of his children who need him uh, to God in prayer. So I invite you to rise and let's pray for our brothers and sisters. And Father, we pray that you would be with us all, but especially to be with all those who suffer today, and that you lead them to hope, the hope that is only in you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Jesus, we pray for the poor, that they might find true riches in the word of God and be blessed by our generosity. And Father, we pray for any and all who are victims of hatred and anger and violence, not just in the, in the physical sense, but also with the words we speak. Help us, dear Lord, to speak words of love and not hatred. Lord, in your mercy, your Heavenly Father, you bless us with a great nation. And so we continue to thank you for this great nation, and we continue to pray for our leadership, that you will be with them and to bless them with with the wisdom and the knowledge they need to lead us in the ways of peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, we raise up to you this morning Samantha and Jessica, who will be undergoing a second knee operation. We pray for Tracy, and we pray for Tanya, who is having a very serious surgery. We pray for Mrs. Smith, Nora, and Gracie's teacher who mourns the death of her grandmother. We pray for Tony Doyle and Don Esteline, the family of Marianne Hans and Adele Woolman, for Tori Brinkerhoff and Bob Barnett, for Mick Elmer and Joe Streeter, for Ellie Kopensbager, and now her father and sister, Kena and Abby, who are under the weather. For Denny Brannock and Shirley Hardesty and Val Finkenbeiner, for Brecken, Avonlea Brannock, and all in our hearts and minds this day, dear Lord, just bless them with your presence. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. So, Heavenly Father, we just commend to your care all for whom we pray, trusting that you hear our prayers and answer them according to your will for our lives. And we pray it all in the powerful name of Jesus who taught us to pray with the words, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. It's one thing to leave worship every Sunday morning, but today we were encouraged with the Word of God to not to be complacent, to be prepared. And so we are. And now let's go forth in that love of Jesus Christ. And may the Lord God bless us and keep us. May he make his face to shine upon us and be gracious unto us. May he look upon us in favor, and may he always bless us with his peace. Amen. Lost are saved, find their way at the sound of your great name. All condemned, feel no shame at the sound of your great name. Every fear has no
I'm too weak to climb. Promise that you're with me in this fight. I can hear the thunder, but I'm okay. Cause you're with me. I know you. Tragedy could hold the sharpest blade against my skin. Threatening to open all the wounds I've tried to mend. Would you come and be the healer that I know I've seen before? You've promised me that I can be restored. Oh, I can hear. 